Bird, 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 bird! Feeling, I'm feeling spry. Hey everybody, it's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. I'm telling you what, first, you know, I always start off with thanking everything. First, my apologies, okay? To my patrons, who I love so much, my oldest, longest standing sponsor of this podcast, I bumped the... Uh, Patreon Zoom room to Wednesday. Totally messed it up with a little bit of family schedule, but a lot of my dumbassness. And then when I realized I could not rectify that situation, I re, uh, re I sent a new a new email to everybody and said, "Sorry, Wednesday didn't happen. It's back on for Thursday." But Wednesday night I was out with my dear wife, and. I don't know if I had food poisoning or I was cleaning up the puppy's old pen. Maybe I ingested a little bit of puppy feces from back in the day. I don't know what it was, but Thursday was death's door. I mean, we did a COVID test. I was ready to go to the emergency. I, I, but I just, I, I swear to God, I laid in bed and I felt like, oh, this must be what it feels like to die. So then I had to apologize to everybody and tell them the Zoom room was canceled for Thursday. So first and foremost, my apologies to all my patrons. We'll do a Zoom room next week. You'll get the invite. It is going to be on Wednesday, which is not our normal night, which is why I kind of screwed up this last Wednesday. But we'll get that together. We'll catch up with everybody. We'll tell you what's going on with the podcast. We'll tell you what's coming up. But I had to apologize for that FUPA and, uh, and like I said, I think, to the best of my knowledge, it was food poisoning because it seemed to be fine today. Anyway, now thanks goes to my title sponsor, On X Hunt. Um, they do everything for this podcast. They do everything for you to find places to hunt, hike, swim, camp, uh, kayak, uh, bicycle, off-road. They, they, they help you do everything, and they help this podcast stay in the groove they help the Upland Institute as part of their Onyx Elite program. There's going to be some really great stuff coming up. So if you're not an Onyx member, you might want to use the promo code HTP20 and become an Elite member because there's going to be some really cool stuff coming up with Justin and I, uh, adding to our repertoire of, uh, what would you call it, Elite Membership. Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Elite Membership Privileges there that you'll only get. Through the Upland Institute, through Onyx Hunt. Yeah, my title sponsor. Pike Gear, technical clothing for the Upland Hunter. Just had a, uh, an event, and I know I told you about it last week. It was with the RGS team, and it was on their YouTube channel last Tuesday at 8 p.m. I strongly suggest you go back. Go to Pike Gear YouTube channel and watch that. There is, it's got me fired up about conservation, membership, next season, uh, really informative. If you're a grouse hunter, you know, even if you're, I don't care if you live in Arizona, you'll find it interesting because they had just a, I think they had six different people on from RGS telling you what's going on, where it's going on. I mean, I'm telling you what, we're cutting trees, okay? We're cutting trees. We're not trying to save trees. If you get an email that says, please think twice about before printing, no, print the email. Let's cut trees down, okay? We need regenerative forest. Pike Gear is helping. They are a, a main sponsor of RGS now, and we want to cut some trees down. So besides, you know, wearing your Pike Gear, <clears throat> know that they're helping to cut trees down. Boss Shot Shells are helping to cut down those birds in the sky. That's all I can tell you about that. They're not cutting any trees down. They're not going to help you find a new place to hunt, but they are going to give you the best ammunition you could ever put in your scatter gun to knock the birds down. Just like Walton's gives you the best spices, the best equipment, the best stuffers, the best slicers, the best sausage makers, the best smokers, the best, the best, the best, the best. Go to Walton's. Trust me. I've told you this for over two years. Get their catalog. I mean, you know, if you're in trouble for overspending, all right, you know, just go online and look. But if you get the catalog, you will not be sorry. 
no, no more than be sorry of ever getting that gunner kennel that I know so many of you have. And I, I met so many of you at Pheasant Fest and the gunner kennel food crate, the gunner kennel. I mean, whatever they make is, uh, it's, it could have been made for like the war, right? I don't know if they could take a howitzer or an M50, but a gunner kennel could take a shot from a, a shotgun. Yeah. And I don't know how that would ever happen. I guess maybe unloading your gun from the truck. But if you're an idiot that still had your gun loaded and it was in the truck, I don't really want you listening to the podcast. But just let you know, if you're that idiot, the gunner kennel could take a 12-gauge blast. It could. The food crate, I don't think it could take a 12-gauge blast. You just might have to get a new one. And they're not going to guarantee it. Even though all their products are guaranteed for life, they're just not guaranteed for bullet holes. Garmin products around your dog's neck make everything just come together. Whether you're new at it or you're experienced, whether you're just training or just hunting, you can find a Garmin product for your dog that will be exactly what you need. And, and I get a lot of these emails around what, what Garmin products should I get. Well, I would defer you to W Hunting Supply because they're the real experts. But I will tell you that a training collar is a training collar and a tracking collar transmitter is a tracking. But Gunner has, or <laughs> Gunner, I'm not, I'm not going to redo this. This is like my 11th take today. Garmin has units that you can keep both things active. I will still not tell you to get the Alpha 200 if you're going to just train dogs, but I'm going to tell you, you can, you can, but the timing, get yourself to 550 plus. Get yourself the Instinct Watch. Get yourself a TT15. You will never look back. And then if you need all the data, like how many footsteps your dog ran and all that other stuff, well, then, you know, get the 200i, get the Alpha 10. Get, get, go ahead. It's fine. But whatever you do, get it from W Hunting Supply because they are going to take care of you. I'll be totally honest. I had somebody write me an email, and I wrote, I sent that email right over to, to uh, my friends at W. Um, out of two years, we had one person say, oh, I didn't get a returned email, and I found it somewhere else. Well, my apologies to you, but I can also tell you five emails, or I could read them to you, of people that listen to the show and go to W, and one of them recently just said they have a customer for life. So there, right? Just like Purina Pro Plan, that's my food for life. That's the only food I've... <clears throat> Sorry, it's a little, little, still a little froggy. That's the only food I've ever fed my dogs. And that's the only food I'm going to feed my dogs. You can hear about all kinds of new foods. You can hear foods that come on strong and start advertising. <clears throat> Show me the food company that does the research, has the scientists, has the dietitians, has the background that Purina does. And you, know, you might convince me to come to your side of the fence. But until then, I'm not doing that. And you shouldn't either. And canine athlete and wilderness athlete, if you, if you don't think your dog could use a little extra something, like some hydrate and recover in your water when you're working out. Just, I mean, like, I put hydrate record in recovery in my water. I use energy and focus every day because God knows I could use the focus based on last Wednesday's FUPA. But your dog can use the same thing, okay? It is, they've, and here's my, here's my tip of the week, Ron's tip of the week. If you like energy bars, and that's a bad word for saying cookies, right? Uh, it, what, whoever makes them. You know, you, you know, there's the ones that look healthy because there's a mountain climber on it, and then there's the ones that come from, you know, right from M&M Mars, and they all call them granola bars. But I'm telling you what, they were passing these things out at Pheasant Fest, and it's called the Packout Bar. You get the peanut butter and chocolate chip Packout Bar. Oh, my God. That is, you put that in your pack. If you're, if you're backcountry, and I'm not backcountry hunter, you know that. I'm not wilderness hunter. I keep those in my truck once a day, and I swear to God, it, it's just the size of a damn Snicker bar. It's not that thick, and it takes you about 10 minutes to eat it. It's so dense, so good. You will never regret. And if you're a patron, you can go, we get some great discounts for patrons. I, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Anyway, this weekend, I'm going to try to do, <laughs> I'm going to try to do a scheduled release if my daughter Jessie helps me out with it. Uh, next next week's episode will come out on time next Sunday, like it should. 
But I'm going to be traveling to Oklahoma. And uh, if you listened to an episode a few weeks back, if you didn't, you can dial it back and listen to it. I'm going to go down and do a little a little talk at the Qu- pheasants. Uh, the be, be, sorry, the Quail Forever um, chapter in Oklahoma, and it's the uh, oh what is it Canadian Valley, which sounds funny or you know that doesn't sound like it should be in Oklahoma. But anyway, just in case you didn't hear that one and you just tuned into this one, look up the QF banquet. In Oklahoma, it's just outside of Oklahoma City, and it's the Canadian Valley, Canadian River. Jesus, I, I should have looked it up before I started recording, but you know, I don't do anything like that. Um, I'll be down there. I'll be talking at the banquet, and the following day, they're going to get me a training table and some dogs, and we're going to show you a little, a little what Ron knows. Now, I am not a trainer, but I know enough to be dangerous and enough to entertain a few people and help them with their dog and show them the value, which is my biggest thing. The training table is like a schoolhouse. If you tried to teach me English, writing, and arithmetic in the playground at school when I was a kid, uh, it would have been really tough. You put me at a desk, you put me at a table, and then I can learn something from the teacher. And I'm going to show the benefits of that. So if you're in the area, or even if you're out of the area, grab a buddy and come on down. Come to the QF Fest. The Q, Jesus, I am not redoing this. I refuse. Believe me, I'm, this is like my ninth take. Quail Forever, Canadian Valley, and if I screw that up, you'll figure it out. It's in Oklahoma. Look up the word Canadian. Like Google Quail Forever, Canadian, Oklahoma. You'll find it. I'll be there this weekend. This week's episode is with Phil Francone, and he is from Mindel, USA. You're like, what the hell's Mindel? Okay, well, if you know Boots, and you pronounced it wrong like I did for many years, we always said Mendel, because we don't know that the I before the E is an E and an I. And anyway, so a good friend of mine, Mark Peterson, got me in touch with Phil, and I was just looking for Boots. And with my feet, I needed a, I needed a wide, and I had a little, I have a little bunion issue, and uh, Mark put me in touch with Phil. Phil put me in touch with a pair of Boots. And I told him that I was going to have him come on the podcast and just basically tell everybody how much I love these boots. And in all honesty, I had a pair of these probably 20 years ago, maybe, maybe 25, 25 years ago. I, I bought a pair, and I think it was on my first trip to Europe. I actually wore them for work. I ruined them. I mean, I wore them for hunting, but as a millwright, I wore them. They were so damn comfortable. And so supportive, I, I turned him into a work boot, and I pretty much ruined him, um, you know, in the building trades. And, you know, we've all gone through boots over the years, and I just, uh, I was just tickled. I, I've been in a boot struggle. If you've ever been in a boot struggle, you know what it's like. And uh, so glad that Mark, I, I want to thank Mark Peterson for introducing me. And I want to thank Phil for coming on. We talk boots. We talk a little hunting. We talk a little bit about how he needs to bird hunt more and elk hunt less. But that's okay. We're all hunters, and we all need a good pair of boots. Hey, everybody. It's Ron Bain with the Hunting Dog Podcast. I am on the phone with – well, I'm on a Zoom phone call with Phil Francone. And uh, I got turned on to the company that he uh, owns the distribution rights for. And most of you – I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the name of the boot the way you mostly do, and then I'm going to tell you how to say it right, and then I'm going to have Phil introduce himself. If you've never heard of Mendel boots, then you're, you're not a hunter because hunters are obsessed with their boot wear. We all know that. It's like a bunch of ladies at a, at a garage sale when we talk boots at hunting camp. Um, but the proper pronunciation is Mindel. So, Phil, take it from there. Give me a little Mindel history here. Yeah, you bet. Uh, really appreciate you having us on, Ron. Um, my history with Mindel is long. I, I actually met one of the Mindel brothers. The, the Mindel family um, has been building these boots forever, but I did get to meet one of the brothers in 1995 when I was working at Cabela's at the retail store in Sydney, Nebraska. So long before Cabela's was really, you know, the big giant corporation it is today, we yeah. just had two stores. And uh, the, the Mindel family, the Cabela's group, had the exclusive rights on distribution for the Mindel hunting product. And uh, he was one of the guys that came over and kind of taught me the first thing I knew about Mindel boots. And then as time wore on and things 
kind of came to be with Bass Pro and Cabela's, um, Mindel ended up separating off and I ended up working with that family again uh, to bring Mindel USA to back to the US um, in its in its own kind of uh, in its own way and in its own structure. You know, people don't I mean, I said that kind of tongue in cheek, but we we are obsessed. I mean, <clears throat> you know, you're a deer hunter, like really big deer hunter. But I mean, you're yeah. a waterfall hunter, upland hunter. Um, yeah. We obsess about guns. We obsess about clothes. But I think boots have got to be right. It's it's it. The first thing you're going to hear somebody complain about is their feet, right? Yeah, Especially it's it's, it's huge. It's it's bigger than huge because like every everything you do is a step. Whether it's a step up a tree stand or you know chasing a bird. And I I've been. I like I was I was in the construction trades for my entire life and the first 30 years of it I had one one pair of boots from not one pair one model of boots from Red Wing when they were all made you know back they're all made in Wisconsin or Minnesota yep. rather yep yep and they had a crepe bottom they wore out fast but I could get them re and I literally had a couple pair it's about the only thing I've ever been fanatic about like I've got I mean I'm on my feet on concrete all day long right and you, you kind of wish that people were more fanatical about their boots because of the long-term ramifications of not being. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I've even had young kids on a job with some cheap boots. They'll go get a, they'll go to Walmart and cause you know, they got a new job. They're a new kid. And, but I had a good mentor back in the day. And this guy said, he goes, he literally took me to the Red Wing store and he says, you're going to wear, you got to wear Red Wings. He was an old iron worker. And yeah. I never look back. So I've been a food, a food, not food, a foot comfort nut my entire life, you know? And uh, then when we got introduced through Mark Peterson, I, and it was a, it was a flat out honest, like, Hey, would you like me to, would you like me to try out your boots? I'd love to try out a pair of your boots, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and I, and I, we had a really frank con candid conversation and lo and behold, you guys sent me a pair. I think it was the vacuum. Was it the uh, yeah. yeah, the vac vacuum hunter? Yeah, vacuum. it's uh, it's just the German spelling of the word vacuum. So we, right. it's just all about the well, way I was the, trying, the, the I was trying to be fancy. I was trying to be. German. <laughs> I was going to give you my four words I know in German. <laughs> That's okay. You you uh, you probably pronounce it better than I do. Um, so, vac vacuum. Vacuum. Yeah, vacuum and. Uh, and it, it was funny because, I mean, when you talk to somebody in those boots, I, I was talking to you and your counterpart or one of your guys, Riley. Yeah. And I told you what boot I had from another boot. And they said, okay, we're going to send you. I said, I think it's going to be small. And they know, I think it'll be fine. I'm like, I know I'm going to send these things back. And bingo. You know, I took them on their maiden voyage to uh, North Dakota. And, and I know enough, you know, not when I'm using my old Red Wing boots, but I, I wore them for a couple hours one morning. I wore them for a couple afternoon hours and I was there for two weeks and in two weeks I was wearing them all day long. Awesome. And you know, it was, God, I mean, I know this is an infomercial of sorts because I'm talking about how much I love the boot, but I'm also one of them guys who's hopped around the boot world. <laughs> you know, I'm sure, sure you've sure. done them, right? Yes. Um, you, you go to a hunting camp and somebody goes, Hey, have you tried this one? No. Boom, you're home, you're home buying them, you know? <laughs> We're like a Melvin Marcos of the hunting world. <laughs> you're not wrong. <laughs> so, and it's an expensive, it's an expensive hobby to get into. I mean, it, yeah, it's it, almost, it gets it can get very yeah, expensive. It's like, but it's like duck hunting, you know. The only thing at least you don't have to buy the boat to go bird hunting, you know. <laughs> but uh what give me a little of the history of the the boot company. I people can look it up sure. online, but it, it's yeah. a very old, very old company. Yes, uh, Mindel, the Mindel family has been building boots in their family since, for 300 years. The 10th generation has been born. They're not in the business yet, but they're up and rising. They have been, it was modernized really post-war, as you might imagine. Yeah. They, they were in the boot trade, boot building, cobbler business um, in the early years. And in 1949, Alphonse Mindel, who's the father of Lucas and Lars Mindel, they run the, the, the operation today really took it to the next level and, and really developed the brand. And Mindel has built everything from cross country ski boots to climb to the top of the mountain ice, you know, climbing type mountaineering boots all the way up to um, 
and I'll be darned, I cannot remember the guy's name, but the that crazy daredevil dude that jumped out of the space balloon and sky dove out of the balloon. Yeah. They, yeah. they developed, they developed the footwear he wore on that specifically because of the pressurization and all the things that he had, they had to go through. So from a technology perspective and, and the detail and the workmanship and all of the quality aspects that go into building a piece of footwear, these guys are unbelievable. The family just knows what they're doing. They build it in the, I'll call it the old world way where right. um, the, it's, it's, I mean, it's a BMW car, right? So you think about what you get out of a BMW, you're going to get really, really good manufacturing quality. You're going to get really, really high-end uh, materials, and you're going to get great comfort. And that's really what the Mindel family is doing in, with the with the footwear world and the hunting and hiking boot world. Yeah, I, I can't say enough about them. I, I I'm looking forward to you know like spring training, just putting them. I have I probably haven't had them on in a month, but yeah. Um, I, it was a. It's almost like they. Uh, I don't want to say had a memory to them, but I've had a lot of boots that are hard to get the tongue right. Like you, yeah. you've, met, I've, I've literally had a cut down on tongues. Um, you know what I'm talking about? Like they you just they pulled up on your ankle, and it's like I. The only thing I had to do was they kind of just found their way. You know, I, the, the gusset leather. I probably was it in a way I could lace them up quicker. Yeah, the manufacturing process they do for their tongues is really pretty cool because they don't – I've been in footwear factories all around the world through my career, and yeah. whether it be the United States, um, Mexico, uh, Korea, yeah. China, Vietnam, you name it, um, the way they do their tongues is different. They use that Napa leather in the, in the gussets to make sure that it's nice and it's flat and it's thin. It's still yeah. strong, but it, but it really – folds in nicely and doesn't put a pressure point on your shin or on the top of your metatarsals or coming up, you know, through your ankle. They really yeah. do a great job the way that they put that through the process. It's on, it's just a really pretty cool deal to see. Yeah. What's uh what's the, is there, I know with, I mentioned my old work boots, red wings. Yeah. They, they would always have some pair that some guy brought in and he bought it in 1962. <laughs> is, yeah. is there any, of course, I mean, if you wear a boot enough, it's going to wear out at some point you for bet. sure. I mean, you it's bet. not a, it's not like the gunner kennels that I, you know, represent. They're not made, they're not made for a lifetime, but you bet. what, what could you expect? Like average, would you say for a, a pair? It's a really good question. And, and it's going to vary, right? So I liken it very much to tires. And yeah. if you put brand new tires on your car and you put a hundred thousand miles on them in one year, you're going to need new tires next year. Mm -hmm. if if you are a guy that is you know putting 20 30 thousand miles on and you're out there yeah. a good bit they're gonna yeah. last you probably three years four years five years and if you're a guy that gets them out three to four or five times a year you're gonna get five six seven eight years out of them and, and they're gonna last you a long time but we've had guys and i'm not kidding you that come in a boot's 20 years old and yeah. the the sole falls off and you know over time the, the <laughs> yeah. world <laughs> everything that is in the world conspires against rubber and conspires against polyurethane things a lot of boots are made out of yeah. right so ozone yeah. and all of that stuff it, it you know, over time things are just going to start to fall apart um as with as with anything but man if it's it's really i've got a buddy who every single year he is a massive elk hunter and he hikes and he hikes and he hikes and i give him a pair every year because he's just he's a number one a good buddy of mine but he also gets some pretty awesome photography uh in, in our boots so yeah he's a guy he's a guy that would never get two years out of a boot maybe maybe get two years out of a boot but that second year he's gonna have him you know he's gonna have right. him down to a nub yeah he's probably also experiencing like he knows the break-in and he knows how comfortable they are he probably yes. has this point where it's like oh my day just got a little harder i wonder why it was <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna call up i'm calling up phil and i need some boots <laughs> yeah he, there, he's one of those guys. I don't know anybody that's in the field more than that guy. He's he's yeah. just he's just out and going. And that in that rocky stuff too, in the in the hill yeah. climb, and that's a whole absolutely different. You know, like it'll it'll take me years to wear mine out. You know, I'm I'm walking on flat yeah. ground. I'm not really absolutely right. Other than the comfort and the support, yeah. You know, I'm not shoot. They, you know, I they're sitting behind me on the shelf here, and yeah. uh, I you might get a little stubble on it. You know, a little beat up from the stubble and whatnot. But yeah, that's no, about I mean, it. Yeah. Thank goodness. Um, cause I, you know, um, I don't, I don't need to go look at any more. I don't need to go look at any more. <laughs> now I'm going to end up leaning on you in about three or four years, Phil. <laughs> Just give me a call. No problem at all. 
um, no, but I, I really, I just wanted to say, I appreciate it. It, it was great to yeah. give them a test run and I wanted to wait till I warm for a season. And, uh, uh, you know, and I, I get people on the other side of the coin that call me up and say, Hey, would you talk to me about this? I almost had to drag you or Riley. Like you're, he's like, no, just wear them, just wear them. I'll talk to you later. You know? Yep. And I wanted to get together with you guys and hunt this year and it didn't happen, but, um, you normally you're in Kansas now, but you're normally in Nebraska. Correct. Um, when you when you're not chasing the deer and elk, what's what's your uh, what's your favorite thing to do? Man, that's a really good question. I uh, in the summertime, I spend a lot of time here at the farm. I really I've got the river, and I like to, to catch catfish, and I like to you know just generally be in the kayak and up and down this little river that I that I have right next to my farm. I I do like to golf, so I'm, I'm kind of I'm one of those guys that. Oh, is, we uh, gotta end this now. Sorry. I know. I know. Is over. <laughs> this is where this is where it all comes crashing to a halt. It all comes crashing so. down. <laughs> so I uh, I say that knowing full well the the verbal B rating that I probably uh, deserve from a lot of my cohorts in the in the space. <laughs> yeah. Um, that happens. But then on the other side, uh, man, I, I I chase a lot of stuff around. I grew up waterfowl hunting. It's still in my blood. We my grandparents owned about a mile and a half of the North Platte River in nebraska and if you've if you've been around that you know it's a waterfowl mecca and that's yeah. really where i grew up but i get in the mountains and i chase elk around uh, whether it be colorado or new mexico typically and mm -hmm. uh and then I, i'll chase some mule deer and some and and some antelope around in nebraska on occasion but really the thing that 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 keeps me going is is taking care of white-tailed deer I, I love to do the the food plotting and i love to you know, maintain a camera system and see what's going on and, and grow them up and, and be very specific about the animals I'm targeting. Yeah, that is, that is so, I've always said the, you know, deer hunters or big game hunters and bird hunters, there's, there's crossover for sure. Because huge, you, guys, huge, huge. you guys like to shoot our blue grouse for lunch when you're up there. <laughs> <laughs> I find it <They're>, disgusting. <laughs> I've, I, I've put a few of those on the spit. Yeah. I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but you know, when you're a bird hunter, or like you've duck hunted a lot, and you grew up duck hunting, yes. goose hunting. Yeah, it's like there's never there's a you might think of bag limits, but you never there's nothing else to mess with your head, right? There's True. there's not a pheasant with a four foot tail that you know <laughs> would, would would make you get jumpy, right? True, that's and, a good point. Uh, I don't know. I think I'd be the world's worst big game hunter. You know. Because I would, I would see something come out. You'd probably set me up on a blind and say, "All right, Ron. Now, you know, sometimes these deer. The first thing that would walk out, I would shoot it because I feel like I'm pheasant hunting. You know? <laughs> and I'm yep. like, you hey, I got one. Help me drag it out.' And you'd be like, "Oh, Ron, <laughs> Jesus." It's um, made it's made me as a very impatient person into a more patient person because. Um, in a tree stand, I become a very patient individual and in, in, in the, in the real world, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not so patient, but yeah. it's pretty interesting to see that your mindset shift. Yeah. Now, didn't you mention, um, you got to go over to, to Europe where the, the Mindel factory was, did you do some hunting over yes, there? I do. I did. Um, we go over and visit with the Mindel brothers, uh, pretty much annually. Uh, mm -hmm. our good friend COVID made a mess out of that for a while, especially with the way the European union handled that yeah. but we get we, we get back over there and i have spent some time in the hills with with lucas mindel in austria and we've chased uh chamois and red deer and even marmots which is kind of strange but uh they do hunt yeah. marmot over there and I've heard um that. And, I've heard that. And, and and chase some marmot around so it's been it's it's just a really it's really cool over there it's beautiful it's it's idyllic it's like you're hunting in the mountains in the sound of music i mean it's beautiful and unbelievable and man the reverence and the uh pageantry and the pomp and circumstance that goes into the way the europeans uh hunt and how they handle their game and how they um pay respect to the game is really a really cool experience yeah they they take it i i've heard people complain you know you know you, we all know the public land you know we're we're so blessed we have public land and everything over there is private yes. but we could take some lessons from the way they treat things um, there's no doubt I, I i've said for years uh, because i've been involved with the the versatile breeds and with that i've been involved with what's called the vdd gna which is the german wire hair from from germany which is the draught sure. Deutsch, Deutsch draught 
And so I got to meet some of the judges. I got to meet some of the people here that were going to be judges. And they are so respectful and so detailed on how they hunt and what shot they'll take and how long it takes to even just get your license. And like, you almost have to be like, I have a minor in forestry to, to go out and, and, and we, we, we just, we go to Walmart and buy a license and run around like an idiot here. I, I love that. It's pretty true. I love it's, that European culture. I think we could use a little more of it. It's amazing. We, the, I mean, when, when we go over, we always start out in the same place. We go to yeah. a, a shooting, a shooting club and we shoot mm-hmm. the rifles, make sure everything is square. And the shooting club has been there for, I don't know, a couple hundred years, 300 years, the yeah. old targets on the wall. And, and so they're very, very cognizant of your marksmanship. And off you go and into the mountains you go. And if you do happen to be successful, it is the Weidman's Heil, which is, you know, obviously the the congratulations to the hunter. And then the Weidman's Donk, which is uh, the thank you um, from the hunter back to the person saying Weidman's Heil. And then it is the last biddance or the the final meal for the animal. And then you obviously take, you, they, you put a bow in the mouth of the animal and then you take a little bit of that and put it in your hat. Um, yeah. the, the symbology, the, the, the old school way, the just reverence they give the animal. It's amazing. It's really, really cool. Yeah. And it doesn't I, matter if it's a bird or a, or a mammal, right. Uh, or they, an animal. They, I mean, they, they, they treat everything the same, right? There's no tossing it in the back of a truck. There's no, no. grip and grin weird stuff. I mean, they yeah. like when it, for people who might not have caught it, when you said the bow would be the bow of like an evergreen or, and, yeah. and, and even depending, I believe depending upon the sex of the deer, I think it goes on one side of the mouth or the other. I thought I read that somewhere. I mean, there, that, that may be the truth. I'm not, I'm not sure of that, but that very well, I mean, it would not surprise me one bit if that was not something, you know, they, they, besides making, besides making good boots, they can do anything, you know? Yes, they can. A Um, a funny story. We went into town. So we, we marmot hunted the first day we got there. We ended up, I think shooting three or four. I don't remember the exact number. And we go into town and we go to the local, uh, restaurant and we we're going to go in there we're going to have dinner and, and and meet some guys off of a neighboring property we walk into this old school guest house and on the it's the, it's a hotel on the f- second floor uh restaurant on the first floor and mm-hmm. you go into the restaurant and there was a big silver platter with three or four marmot laying on top of all of these pine boughs they've eaten they eat each other last bit and in their mouth and these guys are sitting, these German gentlemen are sitting around this table, German and Austrian gentlemen are sitting around this table, drinking beers and paying homage to the marmot. They've got them there at the table for dinner. Right. And you just, and you're like, all, I was blown away. It was really pretty wild. And, yeah. and you're kind of taken aback at first, but then you realize, you know what, that's, hey, they're paying homage and they're, they're doing it the way they do it. And it was pretty cool. Right. And, and for them, what's, and this is, this goes to the dog stuff. Um, I'm not sure if this happened with you, but in most cases or in a lot of cases, um, I interviewed a fella that's in, it was in the air force station in Germany and he got into the hunting culture. He was there long enough to really get involved with it. And, uh, the, um, the, the recovery of game is like, is as important as every other one of the rules, it is. right? Like the besides that's why they want to know that you're a capable shot, but a bad shot can happen. You know, yep. there'll be a, there'll be a dog available to help yes. with the blood tracking if need be. We have a hound yeah. with us at all times and it's, it's, yeah. it, it is part of the game. Yeah. I mean, could you imagine if we implemented that here, we'd, you'd lose 80% of your, you'd have so many deer in Kansas. You'd lose 80% <laughs> of the deer hunters if we had to train our dogs yeah. to, to help us clean up our messes. <laughs> <laughs> I, th- I think we'd have a lot more car deer collisions because there'd be a lot more deer on this planet. <laughs> I, I got a feeling you're right. Yeah. And, uh, and I got a bunch of feeling people would just bring out their, their whatever dog and say, Hey, I had a dog, <laughs> you know, that, yeah, would be, yeah. that would be the new Correct. scam out there. But uh, Correct. No, I think that European stuff is, is cool. And you, you get to go there. Not like just a one-off you get to go there on a, on a pretty regular occasion man yeah it's it's a wonderful deal the the history over there it's spectacular the way that they work the the way that the that business is done the european way it's not Mm -hmm. a fast-paced um american kind of go get the money go get the money go get the money it's more Mm -hmm. of a let's build a relationship let's build a quality product 
Let's build yep. um, a partnership and, and a relationship with our customer and ensure that we're providing service at a level that is far beyond what most would ever do and right. uh, go out there and do it and do it well. And that's, that's how they, they think. They don't think, hey, how do I sell a million pairs of shoes? They think, right. how do I set up the proper situation where the customers that want to wear our product get the best service and the best product that they can get? It's really a pretty cool way to think about it. Yeah, no, it, and that carries through for obviously something we love, but is a is a side, you know, like I always, everybody knows I go into side stories and that's what makes a podcast. Heck so yeah. I was fortunate enough to go to Germany a few times for the company Bosch, which Bosch yeah. is electronics, Bosch is food equipment. In this case, yeah. I was sent out there to um, measure up what we call a filler. And what we were making was those little creamer cups that you peel off the gas station and pour the cream in your coffee. Oh, if, yeah. if, if you're one of the guys like me that puts French vanilla in their coffee. Um, and so I had to go there and watch them run the machine. And then I had to bring a laser out there because the machine's on a flat floor and we're gonna be bringing it into the United States on a dairy brick floor, which would be sloped with drains. So okay. I put my benchmarks on the whole machine um, while it's up there and running. And then I got to know the, all the, you know, I got to know the workers and I got to meet the guys that are actually going to come back over after the thing makes it across the ocean. They're going to, but I'll get to open it up out of the crate and get it kind of roughed in. And I remember when something wasn't going right, the, the company who sent me there says, well, what's the delay? And I said, I think they have a holiday coming up. They, you know, in the, in the summer, they call it holiday. And it yes, goes like, they do. Well, we don't care. We don't, this thing has to leave on a, and they're like, no, we, you guys knew this. This is how yep. we do this. And if something's not running, yeah, you see no panic. Like here, you get this, like someone's breathing down your neck. You're going to lose your job, right? Yes. They, just, they just look at it and they look at it. And you do, you get this sense of like, are you guys trying to will this to be, to work? But they're, they're, they just put so much thought into it, you know? They really do. Uh, and, and then I got to work with them. And in fact, one of them that came over, I um, can't remember his first name, um, Bernard, I think it was. And uh, he knew that we were all dog guy, a bunch of guys that worked for me and one of my main foremen. So we took him to a, a pheasant preserve. And yeah. this guy had shot air rifles because that was the only rifle he was qualified to buy in Germany was an air rifle. He, he didn't bet. take hunter's courses. And uh, so we got to take him. For one, he was just amazed that they would let the United States would let him use a gun without <laughs> ever having a real gun in his hand. Although we did, yes. we did, we took him to a sporting clays range, made sure he wouldn't turn around with the gun. But you I bet. mean, he had the time of his life. But he even, even though he was not a hunter, when he when he did shoot something, there was already like this built-in respect thing, you know. Absolutely. You know. You'll see it on television where it's, oh, look at the beautiful colors. Most of the time you grab the bird. He was holding it and walking it. The gun's over. He didn't care about the next 15 minutes. He wanted to get this thing over to the truck and lay it down. It was yes. and So he probably had just enough knowledge of hunting there. It's like, no, I have to be respectful. And what a, what a pleasure. So I, I'm truly jealous of the, uh, not only of the boots that, you know, um, you represent, but the, the culture you've got to, because I went over there in the work culture which was great being in the trades, but I never yeah. got to get that countryside culture. So that, that is yeah. really me. It's uh, uh, I'm, I'm a very fortunate individual to have what I have. I'm just a little Nebraska small town kid that happened to land right in the hometown of Cabela's and it turned into a hell of a career for me and uh, working for that family for a long time. And then obviously going out on my own, but man, I, I, there's no doubt I'm fortunate to have what I have and to have that relationship with that family in, in Germany because they're just absolutely world-class people and they've, they've taught me a ton. It, were you, have you ever given any thought of seeing if they wanted to come over here and hunt or would we be a little embarrassed by our, yeah. our, our stuff? Have you ever done that? Yeah. Lucas has come over and hunted with us before. Um, he's shot a couple white tail deer. Um, I haven't had him over here recently, but I certainly need to. And that's something that we discuss um, getting him over here as well. So I'm trying to get back and hunt with him hopefully this fall. Oh, and, nice. uh, Try to see if I can get up into um, 
up into the mountains of Austria again. And, and I have not shot a chamois with him yet. We've chased them around, but as I don't know if you're familiar with them or not, but they can basically walk on the side of a plaster wall. It's yeah. impressive. They can go anywhere and they can go a lot of, a lot more places than I can go. So we haven't had any success taking one of those, but hopefully right. I'll get the chance to go ahead and do it again. Oh man, that sounds cool. It, it would be interesting to see what he, what his thoughts were. I mean, he's obviously traveled the world too, I'm sure with yeah. his position, but yep. you know, would you think you'd put in on a, a little pretense on when you're deer hunter or would you do it just like Kansas deer hunter? You know, would it's a good, it's a good question. I would call it a bit of, a bit of both. So yeah. uh, I remember early on um, them coming over early when I worked at Cabela's and they walk in and see the gun counter, right. And, and there's, you know, a hundred feet of firearms Yeah, and, and they're just, they're absolutely blown away by that. Like, dude, it's, it's, it's the same thing, probably similar to what your friend Bernard kind of yeah. came down with yeah. holy crap i can't believe you guys have this many firearms and i can't believe they're just like right out here in the open right and then um so uh but if he if, if and when he comes over here we certainly do probably take things um more seriously at the end of the hunt right so he, he knows how to shoot he can handle himself in a tree he knows right. all of that stuff and so we get him all set up and we're square and we do that and then when it comes time and, and, and he has taken an animal there is quite a little bit of um a little bit more pomp and circumstance around the yeah. congratulations on on the animal and 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 how we handle it. Make sure we get good photography and and all that stuff and and more for him to, to to take home because he's hunted in a lot of places in Europe, but it's it's kind of rare for him to get the opportunity to come over here. So uh, I want to send him away with like really good souvenirs and remembrance. Yeah, no, that's that that is uh, yeah, I'm I'm totally I'm totally jealous. If if he ever gets in. I don't, I don't deer hunt, but let me pop over for the last evening. I would just yeah. love to meet the guy. I'd love to meet the guy. Uh, we, we can absolutely do that. And uh, maybe what we can do is uh, do a little tandem. I've got quite a few quail here on the farm. So you can bring the dogs and we can chase deer around for a day or two. And then we can go chase quail around for a day or two. So that's a good question because when back in the day, knocking on doors, if it's too close to deer season, because you know your property. We, we talked a lot before we yeah. hit record how obsessive deer hunters are with trail cams <laughs> and food plots. And literally, short of naming the deer, you recognize the deer, right? You've seen absolutely, them. Absolutely. Uh, hopefully, you don't call them bullwinkle or anything. But <laughs> no, anyway. I'm not, an, I'm not a deer namer. Okay. But um, a lot of deer hunters would be like, oh, we can't, we can't do any bird hunting. Do you think that bothers the deer? You know, it's a, it's a really good question, and I will tell you that um, if it weren't for if if it weren't for you and for Lucas being here at that time, I wouldn't do it. Um, right. But in the in the interest of having a great time and showing you guys a great time, man, I can give up a year of deer hunting it, it, if if it, if it if it turns out that we push a deer away, we push a deer away. I have yeah. also been in a tree stand, and I've had a buddy shooting ducks probably two hundred yards away and just hammering <laughs> on the ducks, and the deer don't care. So. <laughs> I, I think sometimes uh, us whitetail hunters, we may uh, overcomplicate and overthink some things and kind of turn our human thought process into a deer thought process. And those two certainly don't cross the same path very often. Well, good. So, that'd be my first thought. Like, oh, he's going to let us do that. That'd be, yeah. <laughs> boy, that's, a, that's a deer hunter who knows his property or yep, well, yep. not going to go over there where the cubbies are. <laughs> the, the, we, we wouldn't, uh, there would be really only one little part of the farm that would be off limits from from us walking with dogs but i'm here to tell you that's not where the quail set up anyway so that's, that's the good, good part that's good do you get to chase a few birds off and on back up in nebraska or i, I do i do uh grew up on the north platte river so we had a lot of pheasants around and and we yeah. did a did quite a lot of pheasant hunting it it, it wasn't and and i know i'm on the, the gun dog <laughs> world here in the gun yeah. dog world here I never was truly what I would consider a gun dog guy. And uh, uh, from an upland perspective, I've hunted them quite a bit more than anything. The bird that I chased the most was turkeys. We had a ton of wild turkeys and mm -hmm. I spent a lot of time in the woods chasing them around, but pheasants I've done, I've been to South Dakota multiple times and really enjoyed all of that and then chased them around here. And then I've chased my quail down here pretty sparingly because I really, really enjoy having them around. So I yeah. don't really get after them very hard down here. Yeah. So Riley, who you put me in touch with at, at Mindel, now yeah. he's got a dog, doesn't he? Doesn't he? Isn't he do more, uh, more upland or upland or water? Riley, R Riley, and Dan both. So I've got two guys that work um, there in in Sydney. Um, one's in Lincoln, one's in Sydney. 
top-notch guys. They have really some fantastic pheasant ground, uh, Colorado, uh, right along the Nebraska-Colorado border on both sides of the border. And then Dan is, Dan actually trains, uh, I believe, short hairs, and he's okay. a really good, really good dog guy, knows his stuff backwards and forwards. And, and uh, he actually just went down to Arizona on a quail hunt trying to get a few uh, a few quarter, I think what are two quail species down there, maybe three. Two or three, um, yeah, three of them. Yeah, probably. knocked off, knocked off of his to-do list. So he oh, he really cool. had a good time down there doing that. So I've got a couple of guys in the shop that are just damn fine bird hunters. Well, we we tried to make it happen this year. My schedule conflicted, but I will. And when I travel, I always have my microphone, sometimes my film camera, and uh, we'll get we'll get together with some with some upland and. Yeah, you you we'll let you walk around with us a little bit. I, I look forward to it. It's uh there's there's usually two times a year when I get my over and under out and it's on my on my occasional pheasant hunt or I I actually like to shoot my doves with my over under now too. So I'm oh, yeah. I'm all right with that. Yeah, and doves dove season's early, so that's not a that's not a big big conflict. What exactly. was it like when you were a kid? Like you said, you grew up kind of duck and goose and stuff on the flat river. How what did you have a family had a ranch or something or a farm what was it yeah that, farm. a lot of acres. we had a farm a the river yeah we had a lot we had farm ground uh that river ground was unbelievable growing up uh i'll tell you so it was i have two brothers and myself and then my first cousin andrew uh us four i would tell you we probably caused more problems than we fixed but we <laughs> spent a lot of time we were you know back when we were kids hell i think i was running around by myself with a pellet gun probably eight or nine years old and the gun is yeah. probably a little bit longer than I was, but we were yeah. out and about and John was my brother, my oldest brother, John, he was kind of our, uh, he was the brains of the operation, you know, don't do anything dumb. And he would kind of keep us in line and, and we'd go and we'd shoot there, you know, every barn swallow in the County was in trouble, but we spent <laughs> a lot of time doing that. And we did yeah. everything from, we, we went out and caught snapping turtles. We shot squirrels. We, but we did, we did a little bit of everything. Just when, when the world, like that it's it's a playground for a little kid and there just wasn't anything that was off limits we shot rabbits we shot geese and ducks and pheasants and you name it it was really a cool way to to grow up and yeah. and unfortunately we we ended up my grandparents had, had to sell it my grandpa got real sick and had to sell it and i think i was a senior in high school maybe the year after i got out of high school and uh so it was a real bummer to lose that but um oh, that's yeah. part of the reason why, that's part of the reason why i bought my farm in kansas i really 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 uh i wanted my own you want to be connected to back. this nice piece of land that you could. Yeah. Hey, Mitch, tell everybody, because this is near and dear to bird hunters for sure. Yeah. Um, you know, bobcats, skunks, everything that goes after, everything that eats our birds, yeah. short of hawks, which we can't touch. Um, yep. and, that, and honestly, people get a little confused. There's only so many types of hawks that actually are that are tough on birds, right? Um, you bet um like like red, red tail hawk all i do is eat snakes and mice and shit you know i don't know why yep. people worry about them but you did some real serious trapping this year Give, i mean that yeah. to me is like i'm like oh you should be in a pheasants forever magazine talking about trapping <laughs> that kind of stuff what did you guys do this year so we've been hunting or trapping my farm really hard for about the last six years it's either five or six years my memory collapses sometimes and i'd have to go back and look at some old pictures but um when I first bought this place, I had turkeys coming out of my ears and, and they'd raft up here and on my neighbor's piece and there'd be anywhere between hundred and 150 turkeys rafted up here. And then wow. these last two years, they've been, they're basically gone and, and it's weird. And I'll get pictures of, you know, maybe six or eight or 10 of them. They're, they're just gone. And I think you're seeing a lot of that happen and across the na the nation, really from a Turkey perspective, I know Nebraska has lowered their Turkey limits. Um, and so is Kansas, some avian flu stuff in there. I think yeah. also the price, the price of furs is what's driving us. No, the price of fur has basically fallen, fallen off completely. And right. it's kind of taken people out of the business of, of trapping. And uh, we have had a ton of predators and whether it be skunks and coons and possums and you name it, we, and to, strangely enough down here in Kansas, we have a ton of armadillos. So we chase them around because we know they like to dig stuff up and they're hard on nests. And so this, yeah. this, uh, this winter, my, my buddies came down, um, they run a big trap line in Nebraska and then their dad runs a big trap line in Minnesota and they set their trap line. Um, we went all around my place. We've got some neighboring places and, and, and whatnot. And we took out 48 possums. We took out, I think 18 coons, 
and 15 beavers and six skunks, a couple coyotes and some bobcats. We got five bobcats as well um, wow. in, in the total. And, and I, it, it was, I told the guys at the end when they left and they packed up all the gear and, and, and took their trap gear north. I said, guys, you might want to write this down because we may never see another year like this. It was just truly just an unbelievable year on the trap line, especially for the short amount of time you get to do it. Yeah. And, and it's got to help. I mean, for like the past, you know, the turkeys, let alone the quail and, yes. Yes. and, and the pheasants and, and whatever, whatever grouse you make, you know, there, there's a few, like you said, a yeah. few prairie chickens might be in the area. Yeah. Yeah. And that was, that's always the equation. Um, and, and I, and I, I believe it firmly, like I'm, I'm older than you and I grew up in Chicago and me and my best friend, Ricky trapped the railroad tracks along two cemeteries. Like, yeah. I don't know. It was in a magazine. We said, oh, buy a trap. Oh, we learned to be, you know, we we're trapping punks, punks and pot, you know, yeah. we, we played with taxidermy. We played with trying to learn how to tan a hide. We, we failed at everything except catching those critters because there was so many of them, you know, <laughs> it's, but, it's too much. But, and it's, and it's awfully, awfully hard on the birds. Yeah, it is. It's, you know, everybody, uh, I think just forgets that that was, you know, the fur price, you know, and I don't, I don't think we can fix fur prices, but no. you can still trap. I mean, the regulations are there to still yes. allow it to trap. You bet. <laughs> you just got to look at it as another piece of land management nowadays. You know, it is, a, and I think it's a huge piece of land land management. And um, I think a lot of guys maybe you know they go out every once in a while, they might take, buy an e collar and um, you know try to shoot some some raccoons or go out and put some you know uh, dog proofs in and yeah. you know catch a few catch a few on dog food or whatever they're baiting it with. Yeah. But it, it, if in tr it, a true, um, strong way to improve, I think the likelihood of your bird pulse surviving is to yeah. reduce the amount of nest raiders that there are. And I and I and I I believe in it firmly. And we we sure as hell try to get as many of them out of here as we possibly can. Yeah. Well, then them them bobcats they they don't even have they don't even raid nests. They'll take a covey of quail out at night. You know they're yes they are brutal on quail. They are a prolific killer, and uh, I can't even tell you the number of times I've come upon a, you know, a, a turkey all part, all torn apart. You know, it's just nothing but a pile of feathers and yeah. and cleaned up bones, and and you know, it's you know, it's it's cats, and and they're just so damn athletic, and they're so fast, and yeah. uh, they they are they are really an outstanding killer. Yeah, but you can't even get anything for a good bobcat. Well, you guys probably no. don't have high quality bobcat there, probably. Yeah, our our bobcats aren't worth much. Um, they're pretty much what uh, the cost of what it would take you to skin it and have it tan and, and hung up. They're not gonna, you know, nobody's yeah. gonna make a, a blanket yeah. out of them or anything like that. Or, or a car payment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Yeah, if it's not it's not a Canadian, uh, you know, bobcat or a mountain bobcat. They're 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 pretty uh they're pretty lightly. Yeah built what uh what would you say um are you would you expect from the like you said you've got a few coveys of quail around your place yeah. it, i mean I, it'll certainly be a decent barometer that you've knocked down some predators are you going to see the turkeys coming back too or you think or have they pretty much vacated or are they still hanging on i hope so um yeah, it's I, a hope, huh? <laughs> it is it is a hope and so I've, I've talked to a ton of people and I've talked to buddies and I've talked to game wardens and, and a few biologists and just trying to get their, their thoughts on what's happening. And it's widespread. And, and the two things, the most uh, avian flu, which I have obviously no control over, but the other is the nest raiders. And so I'm going to do everything I sure as heck can to get rid of a few of those, but um, yeah. they will show back up. There's still some birds around. Uh, it's going to take a few years. And, and, you know, mother nature is, she has her way of, um, taking care of the herd. And, and if there was a disease or something like that that needed to go through and reduce the population so that it can, yeah. you know, kind of right size itself again, I, I think she has a pretty damn good way of pulling that off too. Yeah. Did you guys get hit with uh, that EDH or EHD or blue tongue out in your deer? Yeah. Because I know in South we, Dakota years ago, I called a friend that's a farmer and he said, Ron, don't come out expecting to see many birds. And I said, why? He says, well, because I usually see a lot of birds and we all we have all we have is a bunch of dead deer in ponds all over the place i'm like yeah. it wasn't it wasn't connected he was telling me it was a bad year because of the ponds being the because of the drought it was bad for the birds and it was also bad for the deer because of the yeah. mosquitoes did it go through there so, too 
So we got a little bit, I was actually really, really nervous this year because I had a giant deer that I'd been chasing and watching for three years. And this was the year that I knew that it was time for him to be on my hit list. And we had a really bad drought. So I have three, four, I've got four little cattle tanks um, on the place that are all, you know, just dug out cattle tanks. And then I've got a small pond on the South yeah. end and virtually everything went dry except for that small pond. And it was pretty dry. Yeah. And that midge comes out in that mud, right? When everything yeah. is, is going back. And so I was scared to death. I was going to get a big EHD yeah. uh, running the trap lines on the farm this year. We found six dead deer, I think six or seven. Uh, so we did, I think we did get a little bit of it, yeah. but nothing. I mean, I've, I've seen some guys who just, they, I mean, you know, they've got 20 or 30 dead deer. So I, I count myself very lucky, lucky yeah. to have gotten through that drought without having a massive die off. Yeah, we, we, we found quite a few, not, not monsters, but you know, we, we still went out hunting anyway, you know, as we yep, will. Absolutely. And, and, and would find them like always on Creek banks and, and pond banks and stuff. And it, it was, yeah. it was crazy, you know? It seems like they circle right back and land right near water. And I don't, I don't know if that's just their brain telling them, man, you're in trouble. You got to go get some, some nourishment or whatever, yeah. but right along, right along the river bank. I think that's where we found most of them. We found two by the pond and I think we found four along the river. So. Yeah. And I'm sure they were all big giant. <laughs> <laughs> luckily, luckily, luckily none of my big deer went down. So. Oh, good. Um, and for you, a big deer, you, as you mentioned, a big deer is 180 right yeah <laughs> a, I, yeah the, the deer the deer i killed this year was 181 which that's the biggest deer in my life and and to be quite honest with you if you told me that that was the biggest deer that i was ever going to shoot in my deer career i could i could walk away and and feel pretty damn happy about it yeah, that's, um, that's but but man there are some beautiful deer down here kansas does have a, a really number one they have an outstanding program the, they they set it up you can only kill one buck um they really take care of the deer population down here they the just the diversity of the habitat especially where i'm at from i'm yeah. in the flint hills and man i've got everything from big rolling prairie hills to river bottom creek bottom hardwoods and yeah. it's just it's perfect territory to grow a big big deer yeah yeah that's i i was told you before we hit record i i saw some in uh kansas years ago and the farmer to he said ah no nah, those the, they weren't that big and i'm like no i'm telling you they were 200 <laughs> points he's like no no i know where you were that maybe 170 he's i don't get excited till 170 i'm like <laughs> oh you deer hunters you deer hunters well i'm glad that you have a a passion for boots phil because our our past would have probably never crossed if it wasn't for mindle boots we run in a very similar circle all the slower and um my battery on my phone's about to die so i'm just getting my power cord here sorry um yep. the uh the the boot thing rings true with any outdoorsman and mm -hmm. i talk about it a lot and i talk about and this this analogy kind of will cross paths with a bunch of different types but i used to work at the cabela store worked at the cabela's corporate office and we would have guys that would come in and they would buy a five thousand dollar rifle setup right buy a $1,500 rifle, put a $2,000, $3,000 scope on top of it, and then go buy a $100 pair of hunting boots. And you're like, man, I know you're going on the hunt of a lifetime, and you need to get that insurance policy for your feet. Because if, 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 you, if your feet can't get you there, that gun's not going to do you a damn bit of good. Right. And I wish people would really see it that way, because it's, it's the truth. Yeah, it there's there's nothing. In fact, I can't remember. I Riley asked me to write a little testimonial, and yeah. something came to me. It was something like, uh, to to be a successful bird hunter, you put you have to put on miles, and to put on miles, you got to be you got to have a good pair of boots. Period. You, you know? do. Um, you, you, the platform you is the biggest part of it. With, you could probably get away with a little lower quality being a deer sling hunter or one of them tree stand hunters like you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're just walking. But for us who put the miles on, I, I, I tell yes. you, we appreciate it. We appreciate it. I, uh, I spend a lot of time in the mountains chasing elk around and stuff like that. And you're right. Uh, an old uh, tree stand hunter doesn't really <laughs> usually yeah. have to hike, hike his butt off to get into where he's going. So I, I do, uh, I do yeah. feel sometimes fortunate about that. But, man, when you're, when you're putting the miles on and you really have to get out there and, and get yourself um, – you have to put the miles to get yourself in the location where that animal lives and survives. You got to have a good pair of footwear on your feet. 
Yeah. And it's funny with, you know, you could try to get ready. It just never seems like you could try to simulate getting ready, but you can never almost, you can almost never be that ready. It, it always kicks your ass a little bit in the beginning of the season, no matter what, no you matter know, what it, it always does. But man, if you got one, so my buddy, my buddy roof, he's been hunting with me. You, you mentioned, you know, you've been hunting with people since you were like, you got friends from grade school, right? And yeah, yeah, your, your family, your brothers and, and cousins. But Ruth's been, we've been together since we were in kindergarten, hanging out and hunting. And I tried to get him to buy a pair of a pair of gum leaf boots, and he didn't. And he bought a pair of, I think they were just like hardware store lacrosse. You know, lacrosse, yeah, has a thousand variations of boots. And yep, the rubber yep. boot. And he had in in six hours time, he had a blister on his heel so bad that he yes. literally couldn't hunt the next day. I mean, yes. And he had never heard of moleskin. And I went, we went to a drugstore and we got him taped up for the third day and he was back in the game. But I mean, up in the mountains or something or on a trip where you can't get something. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta take care of it. You, know? you gotta take care of your feet. And, and I, I, I say this a lot. And if, if I hand out advice, obviously we sell some phenomenal boots, but you're also sometimes going to get yourself in a spot where, maybe you got crappy socks on or, or yeah. you're um, you've got an injury or you twist an ankle, you do some things like that. You got to have some stuff in your pack to, to, to square you away. So always have a yeah. second pair of socks, no matter what you do, always have a second pair of socks. You, if you're yeah. hiking your butt off and you're seven miles in eight miles into the day, yeah. a fresh pair of socks can be a new lease on life. It can just kind of reinvigorate you, but yeah. you should have more, you should have mole skin. You should, you should have some things to take care of your feet because if your feet aren't working, you're not getting there. Yeah, because it might be all side hill, and you don't, you haven't, you, you, you might have your legs in ready, but you didn't have your side hill, and is all different. Well, I'm, you know what, Phil? I'm going to stick to bird hunting, and you stick to elk hunting. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I do hope our paths cross. And uh, they will. I'm more than excited. I mean, I know we can make them cross, but I'm going to put it on my wish list. Uh, when one of the Mindel, when which which brother is it that comes over? Lucas. Lucas. I would, I'll be excited. I'll bring my, I'll bring my German. Fa I have a German family tree. Nice. Um, yeah. And it goes back to, I don't think it goes back to when they made the first Mindel boot, but it goes into the <laughs> 1700s. And there I know the website, like there's a family crest, right. Of the Mindel yeah. family. And there's a boot there in it, and they were cobblers. And my, my dad's family were bakers. And literally, if you look at a German, it looks just like a dog pedigree, you know, and yes, it actually puts the occupation of the males on the pedigree. And it was Baker. There were no cobblers, <laughs> Baker, Baker, yeah. Baker, Carpenter. Ba apparently I come from, I should be able to bake, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but that's those family traditions that, you know, that it really is. You, you were born into it and you became proficient at it. You know, absolutely. It, it was certainly passed down from generation to generation, this particular yeah. in that family. They have not skipped. They've not skipped the generation. And one of them old Germans that could tie up a pair of boots and put a put a, an all through some leather. I would not want to try to go in a handshake uh, <laughs> competition with them guys. I can't I think, imagine. I think, I, I, yeah. If you've ever seen those those uh, silly slapping competitions where these those yeah. gentlemen stand up and slap each other across the face, I promise you that's something you don't ever want to do with a boot maker. No, exactly. <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna get a big hand across the chops. You're gonna regret it. Um, you will. Well, listen, uh, Phil, I'll let you get going, but I just wanted to again thank you guys for putting me into a pair of boots that really. Um, I mean, and this is just me going another rabbit hole. Uh, I had bunion surgery on one foot; the other foot wasn't yeah. bad. I did take the boots. We have a good cobbler here in Muskegon, uh, and he, yeah. he put him in a. He he stretched the right where he needed to for 24 hours. Um, and I was still expecting to have some foot problems cause I've just got, you know, I've worn my feet out and yeah. I got to say, uh, zero problem. So I can't awesome. thank you now. Well, we're happy to get you in them. Um, and, and we'll continue to be, um, we believe that at the end of the day, we make one of the most comfortable, hardcore boots on the market. We, we right. can put people in places that most other footwear can't and walk out comfortably. It's it's a really good it's a really big deal. It's what we focus on, and it's what we're going to continue to focus on. And as a matter of fact, we have another boot 
we're developing right now, kind of a lighter weight version that will still be built in Europe that I'd love to get on your feet. Cool. Because from a, from a lightweight perspective, usually when you make a lightweight product, you have to sacrifice something. You have to take right. something away. And right. in this situation, I feel like we've, we've made a pretty awesome product without any sacrifice. That's going to get you, uh, especially guys that are in the Upland world, guys who are putting on tons of miles. I think it's going to be a really fantastic boot for them. Oh yeah, <laughs> no, I'd be, I'd be tickled. I'd be tickled to kick them down the field. Um, awesome. And so they're going to, but they're going to feel like the supportive boot, though, right? They're, they're not, yes. going to, they're not going to feel like a a, 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 a sneaker, you know? No, they will not. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me for a sec. I will tell you the one thing that we will never compromise on is comfort and, and, and the platform has to, has to hold you in a way that's not going to wear you out and not really be, you know, sloppy. So yeah. we're going to make sure that, that this European built product is still built in an old world way <clears throat> with yeah. really, really high quality products, but it's going to be built in a way that will kind of go away from our traditional heavy mountain style and be mm -hmm. more of a, a true walking upland uh, yeah, hunting boot. And I think, I think it's just a, we right now we're, we're really, really uh, knocking on wood with this boot because everything that we've done with it so far, testing wise, uh, wear tests and all that stuff, getting them in the field. Everybody's really, really a big fan. So oh. I think we've really, we've really got a great product coming out. I look forward to it. I look forward to awesome. it. Be glad we'll to get do them, it. We'll get them on your feet as soon as we can. Sounds good, Phil. Well, tell Riley, I wish he could have came on. We could have got some maybe some firsthand dog experience, but you know, <laughs> we, we forgive you. We forgive you. We'll, 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 we'll do, we'll do this one. And then from here on out, uh, Riley and Dan can come on and they can talk uh, dogs and, and birds with you guys all day long. Those boys really know their, know their stuff there. He, he, they, they'd probably uh, not regale you with so much silly deer talk. Uh, no, you know, I like silly deer talk. Cause I just like making fun <laughs> of deer. my two of my son-in-laws are two of my son-in-laws would be like, Dad, you know, dad, get out of the room. I want to talk to Phil for the next two hours. They're, they are 100% yep. in your ballpark. Um, but real quick, you before we hit record, last little story. Yeah. What did you do in high school where you crashed something when you were going goose something? What happened there? You wow. you had to quit the wrestling team? <laughs> yeah. Well, when I was when I was young, I was uh, I bought a Ford Ranger, my very first pickup, four speed, four cylinder, tiny little thing, and uh, you know you. At the time, I thought I think I, I think I bought it for like sixteen hundred bucks, fifteen hundred bucks. It was a hell of a deal for the time, and yeah. uh, I was going goose hunting. And there's this little place called Dead Man's Curve. It's on a road between Gurley, Nebraska, or uh, Dalton, Nebraska, and Broadwater, Nebraska. And I went around that corner and downshifted, and and it was in the middle of a blizzard. And I put that truck in the ditch and tipped it over, and <laughs> went a full rotation over and landed it back on its tires, and that ended up kind of turning into my uh, working career because and then my parents were like, well, I don't know who's going to buy your next car, but it sure as heck ain't going to be us. So you better get some <laughs> stuff figured out. So I was, I wasn't wildly athletic anyway, but um, it was pretty much the the death knell for my, <laughs> for my uh, sporting well, days in, in the high school world. Extra, cause I, all your extra bills. shit went away, didn't it? <laughs> I had bills to pay. <laughs> and all so. for goose something in a blizzard. <laughs> all for goose something in a blizzard. So you do have that crazy side to you. All right. Phil. I do. I do. Well, right, I appreciate I'm it very good. much, Ron. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. You bet.